Hello and welcome to Talk Time. And this week, we are talking about Cuba. We're going to talk about everything about Cuba within 55 minutes. We're going to talk about the history of Cuba. We're going to talk about the challenges that the Cuban people face today. And we will look into the future of Cuba. Welcome to Talk Time. It's a beautiful day I'm gonna make most of it It's a beautiful day A day to share with you You'll make my world go round Yeah, yeah, yeah It's really got me saying Nice girl Experience the wide range of top quality and affordable electronics, phones, tablets, home and office appliances from NASCO. NASCO, bring home happiness. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And uh, we are in a conversation with His Excellency, the Ambassador of Cuba, uh, Comrade Pedro Luis Gonzalez. Now, why does Cuba show so much interest in Africa? Why? Because at the end, Cuba is composed by also black people. And since the very beginning, Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro said that uh, we have a, we owe Africa because what happened to Africans that were brought by force to the Western sphere. And instead of coming to Africa to start to collect the natural resources that you have, it's better to come to Africa to help. And this policy was established just three, four years after the Cuba transfer. In this case, I mean by fats, because at the end we have established okay with Africa in in the in the name of Ghana the diplomatic relations. In nineteen sixty three, on the request of Algeria, we have sent a Cuban medical team to Africa. So the Cuban revolution was just starting, was just getting force. But we decided to help according to our possibilities. It was 1963. But then, and the spirit of the young people, and the spirit to help and to fight colonialism all over the world, and to fight imperialism all over the world, and under the request to the uh, liberation movement in that moment, Cuba decided to help them. So Che Guevara traveled to Africa. Che Guevara was here in Ghana. Che Guevara had a meeting with some Angolans. And the decision taken by the leadership of the revolution to help with all our efforts to Africa to gain the real independence so that our compromise was 100% to Africa. And in that moment, okay, we, have, we have help with Cuban fighters, okay, Cuban troops, that they have shared their blood among Africans. And it was a very important thing, because we realized that Africa need the, the help from, in this case, from Cuba, but it's no, it wasn't only Cuba. Some other countries did it, but we put our people in the line, in the soil. You know, we have breathed the African, okay, air. Okay, our people also died here in Africa. Well, we are happy in one thing. 
some country reach the real independence. And the only thing that we did in that moment was taking the remains, the corpses of our people who died in that fight. Now we are also helping Africa, mostly with the Cuban doctors, even bringing teachers. We have, for example, some faculties of medicine in some of our countries, African countries, where the Cuban teachers, the Cuban professors come to teach the population, the young people, just in the soil in Africa. So Africa is very, very important for us. It's very important because of the links that we have. It's the bloody links. It's a blood links, sorry. The blood link that we cannot break and we don't want to break. And we are reinforced, okay, that links every year, every moment, every step. The same way we have received a lot of help from Africa in our fight against the blockade that still is in force. And Africa and the unity of Africa and the African Union as a whole are giving us that kind of help that you uh, uh, need. So this is the link, okay, in the brief that we are having. The same way a lot of Africans has traveled to Cuba to study. So, because it's not only as the same way I, 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 I do or I say, it's not only giving the fish, it's just, just teaching how to fish. So human resources is uh, very important. Africa has, okay, a plenty, okay, human resources. In some years, and now, for example, Africa is the continent that has the most young people in the world. Young people that need to be well educated, that need to be healthy, to contribute to the development of the of the, their countries. So this is the the small help that we are bringing to Africa. Now, Cuba was also very instrumental in the founding of the non-aligned movement. Why the non-aligned movement? So, non-aligned movement is a movement that, uh, in, a, in brief, say it's not aligned with any superpower of the world. So, we, a small country, we uh, didn't want to be under the umbrella of any superpower. So, but it's not only one country so that Cuba decided to, uh, to join the Bandung Conference where uh, the non-aligned movement okay, you was founded. Because having, w when we are together, okay, it's like uh, our hand. Mm -hmm. If we have our hand open, maybe our fingers can be break, uh, broken. But when we close our fingers, it's really strong. That's why Cuba decided to join that movement. Because all of us, okay, the small country, the country that doesn't have the possibility just to build the, the country the way we want, the country that has been stealing for a lot of years, we needed to be together to face that superpower. So that Cuba decided since the very beginning to join the non-alive movement. And not only to be there, also to have a very important uh, role, okay, putting our experience of how to retain the independence and how to fight to build a country for the okay for the better way for everybody. Now, for close to sixty years, Cuba has been under a blockade. Why? And what is the nature of the blockade? Mm -hmm. How is it affecting the Cuban people? Well, the blockade is a, is a reaction from our neighbor, the United States of America. When Cuba decided to, to build a country but ruled by our own and to put things in the correct order but without receiving any indication from abroad 
And when we did some step in that direction, the United States of America decided to start in the process of blockading Cuba. Blockade that was officially put in force in 1962. But just since the very beginning of the Cuban Revolution, when the Cuban Revolution transferred, okay, some states were taken by the, uh, the Americans, in this case, to blockade Cuba. The first thing is just to avoid Cuba to gain some weapons that we need to uh, put in the Cuban people's hands to defend the country. Also, cutting the, uh, the possibility to refine the oil that we were receiving in that moment from uh, the Soviet Union. After that, putting some law, some laws to avoid Cuba to have a normal trade. Until the moment they decided to put in place the blockade in 1962, February 1962. So it's a reaction. It's a reaction against one country who decided to, to build a society, but the society ruled by Cubans, mm -hmm. not from abroad. Blockade is really affecting the Cuban population. Since that moment till now, the amount, at least the overall amount of the, the affection that we have there is more than 753 billion US dollars. That's the effect, effect of the imposition of the blockade. Of the blockade. In dollar terms. In dollar terms. It's 753 more than billion. That, billions US wow. dollars. But it's, re it's, it's, it's really, really difficult to imagine this type of blockade. But in a simple manner, nowadays you can send money through any account, a bank account to from here to any place of the world. No, from Cuba, we are, we are not allowed to do that. If we want to buy medicine, for example, in the United States of America for other the Cuban children, we are not allowed to do that. If we want to uh, go to any place to buy some stuff, and that stuff have at least a percentage of uh, the American uh, uh, product, or uh, it's not product, mm -hmm. spare part is prohibited for Cuba. So uh, it's, if we want to buy food for our population, it's prohibited. So they have put a lot of law under, uh, a lot of steps under a law that affect the real life of the Cuban population. If you want to live freely, to be ready to face all the challenges, mm. and we as Cuban, we have the decision to continue building the sovereignty that we are building, but at the end, we are against the blockade. So since 1992, we decided to put this fight in the, uh, in the General Assembly. This is the real uh, organism that we can use because all the, 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 the countries of the world are, are gathered there. And since that moment in down, in 25th occasion, the General Assembly has voted against the blockade. But unfortunately, the blockade is under the American Congress because it's an internal law that affects the commerce, the trade of the different countries of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the decision and we are going to continue 
okay, expressing our decision and expressing the injustice of that blockade for Cuba. Because we, didn't, we don't deserve that. Cuba, the only thing they have done is to fight for our independence, to help people all over the world, to express our ideas freely, to put our wars at the higher level. But you cannot condemn a country because of that. You cannot condemn a country that has decided not to be under your rules. So if that if it is if it is the the danger that we have to face, okay, we are ready to continue facing that. Of course, we don't want the blockade. And in terms of the relation with the United States of America, we have the decision to to have normal and cordial relation as normal as all the countries of the world. But respect is very important. So we have to respect the decision of our people. We have to respect the decision of our population. The same way we have to respect them. They have to respect us. It doesn't matter that you are a big country and Cuba is a small country. We have to respect also the small people. And the blockade is something that we are going to continue expressing our decision that it has to be eradicated, it has to be eliminated. Because it's injustice. It's injustice. Now, President Obama tried to normalize relations with Cuba. How far did he go? And uh, is it possible that the blockade would be lifted under Donald Trump? There are two questions. <laughs> there are two questions. First of all, Obama, he did positive steps. They weren't enough. He had in his hands the possibility to release the blockade and to put the blockade in the lowest level. He couldn't and he didn't. But at, he, at the end, the step that he put in place were in the positive direction. Of course, it's not enough. Why? Because the blockade is still there. So you can put and did some steps, but the route remained there. The Cuba cannot go abroad and to trade freely with any country of the world, even with them. We are neighbors. Mm -hmm. So in, in a normal direction, we could have the best relation that we can have, but it's not like that. But Obama did and put the things at the end. He was a brave man. Okay, we can consider that. It wasn't enough, but at the end, the first steps were put in place. So this is something important. And in terms of the new president of the United States of America, we have to see. We have expressed our idea and our decision to continue in the same direction. He's a businessman. we are uh, able to to go further to continue putting the things in the correct order but he has to to put and to think very uh, calm the policy towards Cuba we have our arms open to receiving any good proposal but we are waiting for okay the way we are going to do at the end so far uh, we haven't received anything in the wrong way but the blockade 
still continue there. And to normalize the relation with the United States of America, the first thing to be done is to release, to eliminate the blockade. Because it's injustice. It's injustice against a country who the only thing who are doing is just helping and trying to live in the best environment that we can build from ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, viewers, we are in a conversation with His Excellency Pedro Luis Gonzalez, uh, Cuban ambassador to Ghana. We are talking everything about Cuba. We've spoken about the history, we've spoken about the blockade, we've spoken about Cuba's special interest in Africa. We're going to go on a short break, and when we come back, I'd like to raise questions about terrorist attacks against Cuba and then the educational system in Cuba. Short break. What are you looking for? Now I'm getting tall. Greatest guns, no door. Yeah, my feet are sore. Best bodies on our days. Everything here is about game. High quality, put me a priority. So tell your mom, tell Kobe, tell your actually everybody. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time. We are talking Cuba today. And we are privileged to have with us in the studio His Excellency uh, Luis, Pedro Luis Gonzalez, who is the Cuban ambassador to Ghana. Now, sir, there are reports that Cuba has suffered some terrorist attacks. What is the nature of these attacks? Who is behind the attacks and how has Cuba been able to fight terrorism? No, it's clear <laughs> who have been behind the terrorist attacks. The one who has been harbor the terrorists since the very beginning. And in our history it's, diff it's quite different, uh, it's quite difficult to, to talk without mentioning the United States of, of America. The first thing, when the Cuban Revolution triumphed, okay, some people left the country and they were, and they went to the, the United States of America. And using that territory, they started uh, attacking Cuba, okay, using terrorist actions. Thousand of Cuban has died because of that. But we establish a system to avoid this type of terrorist terrorist attack. Even reinforcing our uh, our army and even preparing our population from inside. In every neighborhood, your people prepare to denounce any uh, site of terrorist actions against the population. But as they were well instructed, I mean the terrorists, they were receiving very well sophistic sophisticated weapons and main means to, for example, to exploit inside Cuba. That's why, for example, uh, some explosion uh, were, uh, were put in force in some hotels some years ago, trying to uh, damage the image of Cuba as a tourist site. But they don't only use Cubans, mostly Cubans, then they have changed 
the system and they were using some Central American people to, uh, to send the means of destroyed inside Cuba. So Cuba, since the very beginning of the Cuban Revolution, we, we prepare, okay, our, even our system, our national security system, to face that situation. So that, for example, we have sent so inside the United States of America to prevent from inside the terrorist attacks against Cuba. Just working together from outside and from inside. The harbor, the patron, the father, okay, it's really clear that they were in the American soil. Unfortunately, they have used Cubans that instead of contributing to the well-being of the population, they were, were used as uh, enemies of their uh, the own people, their own population. But there is a, a very important thing regarding that is, okay, what happened with, for example, the Cuban fight, something that all over the world knows. And they were in that position precisely to avoid the terrorist attacks against Cuba. So the combination among the fight from inside and the fight from outside and they're receiving some information to okay the Cuban institution regarding the, the national security has made the possibility just to keep the country safe this is a very important the country safe a lot of terrorists has been caught mm -hmm. in the actions a lot of terrorists has been put in jail a lot of terrorist attack has been avoided and prevented so that Cuba okay, and Cubans, we, we live in a very safe country because of okay, this kind of action. But it's, but it's not only the national security uh, forces, it's a task of the Cuban population, it's a task of any site, any a vestige of action against the stability of the population mm. okay is transmitting through the the ways the the means that we have established inside the country to the appropriate authorities to face that situation just in 1961 we created the cdr Committees for defending the revolution in every neighborhood. It's not an institution from the state. It's a, the, the neighborhood that wanted to be together to face any menace. And since that moment till these days, Okay, this is a, a mechanism that has been very useful to avoid attacks against Cuba. Also, the, the prestige of the Cuban okay, Revolution. And in every moment that we have had in our hand the accurate information, the appropriate information, we have put okay, in the correct way we have used it in the correct order just to avoid any further attacks against Cuba. But it's not only to avoid to put an end, it's also to denounce the action against Cuba. But unfortunately, we have a lot of sad moments in the history of Cuba because of terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. They were a Cuban aircraft that were down because, okay, to uh, explosive, explosive device that were put in the what we call the Barbados uh, mm -hmm. crime 
and more than seven people died in that moment. Seven, seven, uh, 70 people died in that moment. So this is a bloody, sad moments in the Cuban history that we want to avoid. So uh, we are continue, or we are going to continue putting the things and continue building, okay, all the natural structure to face any menace from, uh, from abroad. Mm -hmm. Now, in spite of the blockade and in spite of the terrorist attacks and so on, the reports indicate that the Cuban educational system is very good. Where do you get the resources from? What has made it possible for Cuba to build this educational system? Well, we have reached a country with a very poor condition in this regard. And uh, some steps were put in force since the very beginning, having the possibility to have now the Cuban population with okay a very high level rate of literate and building the infrastructure that can hold this uh, massive uh, force from the country. For example, we have in Cuba 68 universities all over the country. But we are talking about a country, a small country with 68 universities. Population of 11.4 11 11 million, million inhabitants. With 68, 68 universities. universities. We have 451 polytechnics all over the country, distributed all over the country. Okay, secondary school, primary school, kindergarten. So this is a massive force that Cuba has put because having the populations with the rate and population who can read, who can express freely, who can say things, but knowing what is expressing is very important. You cannot build a country with people without having a possibility to read. If you don't read, you cannot understand the war. And the war now is going and is running very fast. So, it's not now, and apart from that, reading a book is very important. It's, and continue being a very important thing. But now we are using internet. Okay, we have to find information all over the system, the media, the press. So having the people, okay, the correct uh, preparation is a very important thing. So 68 universities all over the country. Mm -hmm. and 30, uh, 13 of the out of 68, they are medicines uh, university. So this is a massive effort that Cuba has placed since the very beginning. So the literary campaign had the possibility just in less than two years to put the country in the possibility and the position to receive okay this massive effort from the from the state and all the institution the educational system on the educational uh, institution in cuba in cuba are belongs to the state okay the state put all the resources the national budget more than 20 percent of the national budget every year is put in the educational system so so it's, it's something that uh, is the, the only way you can build a country. And a country with people knowing, okay, what to do and where it, they can go in the future. Now, what is the future of Cuba? Is it true that Cuba is moving away from socialism? What is the future of Cuba? No, the future of Cuba I'm not seeing the future of Cuba without the socialism. It's not, it's not possible. It's not possible. We are putting some steps in order to reinforce the Cuban economy, but under a socialist system. Socialist, uh, socialism, as everything in the world, can be improved. Of course, 
this is something that we can and then we have to do very conscious of every step that we are putting in force have to be very um, taking but very carefully just to avoid to move to the other direction but in Cuba socialists apart from being in our constitution but it's not only be writing in one paper is the people to be conscious that socialism is the, the, the system that we deserve. And the Cuban population is backing the socialist uh, system. Apart from all these steps that we are putting in place, but to put the socialism in a very sustainable way, not without socialism. I, I, I don't see, I'm, I'm not seeing Cuba living in another system. We know what capitalism is, and we had a very sad uh, history moment in that. But to educate our people and to avoid socialism to be turned into the other system, okay, people should study and should know the history. But because when you are conscious and we are you are aware what okay our fathers our grandfathers past what affected them okay you are very sure that okay the system that we have the system where okay my children can go every place in Cuba I'm I'm not afraid of that my peop my children can okay may live and may study freely I don't have to pay for for their education I don't have to pay for the to uh, to receive any medical attention, any medical uh, assistance. So this is something that we are we are proud of that, and this is something that we are going to continue reinforcing. So, in my personal view, I'm not seeing Cuba without socialism. Your Excellency, mm -hmm. thank you very much for coming to the studio. Okay, thank you pleasure. very, very, very much. Well, we have been talking to His Excellency Pedro Luis Gonzalez, who is the Cuban ambassador to Ghana. And we're talking about many things about Cuba. There are some things that I would have liked to discuss, the central role of Fidel and, and so on. But we will have another opportunity to continue this conversation with His Excellency. I hope... All of us have learned a thing or two about the Cuban revolution, the Cuban people, and especially about the fact that Cuba, they are in Cuba, there are so many Africans, so many Africans in Cuba. See you again very soon, and I'd like to say goodbye from all of us at Pan-African Television, wherever you are, Nigeria, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, South Africa, DR Congo, this is Pan-African Television. Please tune in. It's goodbye from all of us, from the production team, from the cameramen, from the makeup people, and so on. Goodbye until we meet again. Bye-bye.